Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's have our Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Schulman, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure thing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, do we have somebody participating by Zoom? No? Oh, okay. My script says we do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, well, right into the meeting, we have now the time for public comment on consent agenda items or items not on the agenda. Public can comment either in person by coming here to the PST lobby, PSTA lobby or by telephone by calling the number on the screen. Um, Clarissa, I know we have someone in the lobby that would like to speak. Uh, Dr. Pamela Settlegood. Yes, we do. One comment, please. My name is Pamela Settlegood. My address is 37. 41 Foster Drive North, St. Petersburg. It's in the Allendale Terrace neighborhood. I live, I live directly across from where a PSTA bus stop has been stood for decades. What? Is this better? Can we start over? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, my name is Pamela Settlegood. My address is 3741 Foster Hill Drive North, St. Petersburg. It's located in the Allendale Terrace neighborhood. I've lived across the street, directly across the street from where a PSTA bus stop and bench stood for decades. The bus stop and bench was located in the public right of way fronting a residence located at 945 38th Avenue North. In Mr. Miller's August 19th email to me, he wrote, and I quote verbatim, item number one, you are correct that the original bus stop had been in that location for a very long time with no major problems. When Allendale neighbors discovered their bus stop was missing, one of them asked me if I knew anything about it. The only information I had came from the new property owners, the Blackmans, who purchased the property fronting the bus stop about a year ago. The Blackmans had approached me asking about some zoning issues. In specific, the bus stop was problematic to them and they wanted it moved. It was moved. It's now located at the crest of the 38th Avenue Hill that crosses the MLK intersection. The bench is gone. The stop is located atop a blind hill at one of St. Pete's most statistically dangerous intersections. One fact the board should know, when Clareview Avenue was widened in the 1970s, becoming the four lane 38, the transit authorities did place the bus stop near the MLK intersection, but authorities quickly recognized how dangerous it was for everyone, and the stop was relocated with the bench to where it stood safely for decades. On August 17th, I emailed Commissioner Driscoll with questions, I provided the PST board with copies of those email responses, which she copied to Mr. Miller. And some, her claims are ludicrous and they're alarming. Review them, please. On August 19th, Commissioner Driscoll emailed me and some, she again refused any accountability, yet she claims, and I quote, the safety of our residents is a top priority for me and I will continue to do that work for the people. It just seems rather tickety-boo with her. Mr. Miller, follow-up email to me, seems to mirror Commissioner Driscoll's conclusion. I believe Mr. Miller was provided misleading information by Commissioner Driscoll, who was seeking, who was relying on an ally seeking favors. The truths presented by Commissioner Driscoll are subjective. Conversely, facts are immutable. I'm here to encourage the PST board to investigate this matter, to determine the facts concerning what happened, why it happened, 
and how it happened. I conclude by asking, why should anyone care about a little bus stop in Allendale? Well, it's a matter of the public trust and that should resonate with the PST board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have any other public comments? Huh. Okay. It does appear that we have a person on the line for public comment. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. They have not identified themselves yet. Okay. Is it is it a is it a board member maybe? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Do we know who this Kyle, this is Brad. Could, could you try to identify who the person on the phone is? Maybe it's maybe it's not um, public. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't give a phone number, and they haven't spoken yet. So. Okay. 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 Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Julie on the public comment line. Please identify yourself if you'd like to speak. State your name and address. Okay, so there uh, is nobody. Like, yeah, it looks like they just hung up. I apologize. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Jura? Yes. May, may I just make a comment on what uh, we listened to here earlier from Dr. Settlegood? Uh, sure. Okay, all, all I want to say is that that stop was moved 300 feet further to the east, and it's actually, um, there is a hill that goes up. And it's a 10 foot raise from 8th Street to 9th Street. So I do believe there are safety concerns there. It's so close to the stoplight. It stops uh, 70 feet from the stoplight, and that bus is 40 feet long, you know, from the intersection. So I'm, I don't know if there'll be any follow up. I hope there'll be follow up just to check this out. All right. And that's all yeah. I have to say. And okay. Thank let you. me just respond, Mr. Cox. Sure. Um, I checked on it. We went through our normal. Um, our normal process of evaluating the safety. We had our supervisors out there. Mm -hmm. They did do a review. Uh, of course, we'll monitor it. Mm -hmm. But yes, there is that hill there. But um, it's it's it met our requirements, mm -hmm. and they they found it was oh it was okay. Mm -hmm. If it if it does become a problem or okay, whatever, then we'll just so you see if we can find out. That. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Let's move on to item three, awards and recognitions. First this morning, we have a very exciting presentation by Whitney Fox, Director of Marketing, who <laughs> will talk about some marketing awards PST STA has received. Whitney? Yes, good morning, board. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my name is Whitney Fox, Director of Communications and Marketing at PSTA. And I am here for a very exciting presentation to tell you about some marketing awards we've recently received. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So I'd like to start with um, the APTA Ad Wheel Awards. And for those of you who may not be familiar, the Ad Wheel Awards recognize marketing and communications efforts of APTA members. Additionally, the annual awards competition creates a structure to share best practices and to raise awareness of the value of public transportation marketing professionals within the transportation industry. So each year, we usually attend a APTA marketing conference where we can share different ideas and different campaigns that we've done, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what has been helpful. Unfortunately, it was canceled due to COVID this year, but we were able to still uh, apply for the awards and we got some great feedback. So next slide, please. Now, just to let you know, there are different categories. Um, first of all, we're separated into different systems, so small systems, medium, and large, based on um, numbers, like ridership numbers. And then there's different categories, so best marketing communications on the COVID-19 pandemic to support ridership, educational initiative, and to highlight transit needs and funding. And then there's subcategories within those categories, next slide, such as print media, electronic media, special events, social media, partnership, shoestring tactic, and comprehensive campaigns. So I'm very excited and very proud to announce, 
that uh, PSTA did come home with three of the APTA AdWheel Marketing Awards, so we just wanted to share with you what those awards were. So the first one was for um, first place AdWheel Award for a medium system, best special event to support ridership. And this was our Autonomous Vehicle Advantage AVA um, media event. This was to communicate the advantages of autonomous vehicles. PSTA created the brand AVA, of course, and held a press conference with elected officials and community leaders in attendance. It was vital to display the advantages of the technology to increase community support and to use local media to get the word out about safety, economic, and environmental benefits of AVA. We earned 62 media stories on the AVA project with 100% positive sentiment, with a media coverage reach of over 17 million, so greatly increasing our public awareness with our beloved AVA project. So I'd like to go ahead and show you our video recap just to remind you of the event. So I'll go ahead and say next slide for the video. First Tampa, now St. Pete's is getting a self-driving shuttle. Named Ava, yeah, that's Ava right there. I guess Marco, the future's here, huh? And I would like all of you to please give a warm welcome to the newest resident of St. Petersburg. Please meet Ava. Ava stands for Autonomous Vehicle Advantage. And it's exciting to see St. Petersburg uh, embracing this technology. There are three mega trends going on in the world of mobility right now. The world is getting more shared, it's getting more electric, and it's getting more self-driving. Those three trends are represented in the vehicle that you see behind us. These electric vehicles can go for nine hours on a full charge, proving that smart transportation solutions can also be environmentally friendly, which fits perfectly with our city's goals of reducing our carbon footprint and becoming 100% renewable. And you may not know, this may not be the first autonomous shuttle in the state of Florida, but it is the first that's gonna go with other vehicles that are driven by other people. Although Ava is only going to be with us a short amount of time, it will give the area a taste of how advancement in technology uh, can benefit transportation. Taking what used to be sleepy old St. Petersburg into the most innovative city in America. So first place for increasing ridership. Yes, round of applause for everybody. We're very, very proud and very excited uh, to win first place for that, for Ava, of course. And then our next award was we won first place um, for Medium System Best Special Event to Highlight Transit Needs and Funding. Now, many of you might remember this was when we received our BRT funding announcement. So PSC had been working towards a BRT uh, for almost a decade, and the last piece of the funding for $21.8 million was granted by FTA on May 29th, 2020, allowing for PSTA to move forward with their plans of constructing the BRT, or the Sunrunner. So PSTA staff was notified about the funding through an evening tweet from President Trump and had to quickly turn around a press event the next morning to control the narrative of, of the funding allocation. Next slide, please. So this event piqued the interest of the Tampa Bay area. Constituents who were unfamiliar with the project were suddenly curious about why PSTA received such a sizable grant. Media coverage of the event resulted in a reach of 18.6 million, with social media coverage on Facebook and Twitter around 17,000 impressions. So that was our second first place award. And then our third first place award was for our PSTA and Feeding Tampa Bay Mobile Food Pantry campaign. We won first place for a medium system best comprehensive campaign to highlight transit needs and funding. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with, of course, a problem in Pinellas County um, and the growing popularity of food deserts and the lack of access to public transportation to get to food. So the strategy behind this campaign was to partner with Feeding Tampa Bay to create a partnership to provide a mobile food pantry at PSTA where people have easy access to groceries via public transportation. So by holding the mobile food pantry at PSTA headquarters, it allowed ease of access for many residents because of the number of routes that connect through this location. Next slide, please. I'd love to give a huge kudos to the leadership PSTA class of 2019 because they use this as their community impact project to connect transit and the community. So we really owe a lot of credit to that uh, leadership class for this whole entire campaign. 
And next slide, please. But I'm also just want to say that I'm extremely proud of our very own marketing team member, our senior graphic designer, Mia, who put her heart and soul into the bus design and all of the collateral materials that were tied to the event, from the logo to the volunteer t-shirts. It really made a huge impact from a marketing perspective. Next slide, please. We even made it to the front page of the Tampa Bay Times. So obviously, we received very good coverage for this event. Next slide. I'll go ahead and show you a recap video to remind you of this event. Well, right now, dozens of Pinellas County families are grocery shopping without spending any of their money. It's all thanks to Feeding Tampa Bay and this new event they're putting on with PSTA. Feeding Tampa Bay and the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority are teaming up. You can see right here, uh, people in line is already packed. I think it's wonderful they're willing to help people. It's meant to help the estimated 135,000 people in the county who struggle to be able to afford fresh food. So this event uh, is part of the Leadership PSTA uh, group project for the class of 2019. So we're doing a partnership with Feeding Tampa Bay and PSTA. The partnership is first and foremost to host a mobile pantry event. We're giving away one free box of food per household. One of the big things is, for us is to move our food distributions to a time and place where it works for people's busy lives. When we know that the people we serve are using PSTA resources to get to our food, so we try to make sure that food is accessible at schools and at bus stops and at places where people congregate. Well, you know, it started out as just a project of our leadership development class. And what's actually happened is incredible to me. The line continues to string out all the way to where they, where they got off the buses. It, it's, it's really surprising how many people have come out, but it just shows how important this is for people to get food. I think the partnership is a good one and it should continue. Um, we're finding where those struggles are, both in transportation and in food. And if we can fulfill both of those, then that's a great day. And I truly believe that what we need to do is give back in our community so many things that have been given to us. I just want to say thank you to the PSTA team for being creative and uh, really innovative. It's enough to try to move you know, a million people around a community like Pinellas to be able to, to think forward and think about the other ways that the community can be served. You know, you have somebody sitting in your bus for 15, 20 minutes. It's a great opportunity to see what else we can do to support them and their family. Yay. I'd also like to announce not only did we win those three AFTA Ad Wheel Awards, but they take all of the first place winners from all systems and they have what's called our grand awards. And we actually won a grand award for the Feeding Tampa Bay uh, campaign. So we're really excited. It's the first time we won a grand APTA award in 14 years. So this is kind of a big deal. So we're really excited to bring that trophy home to PSTA. And once again, huge kudos to everyone and to the board for your support in all of our events um, and all of the awards that we won. Now, I, that was going to be the end of the presentation, but uh, as you may know, FPTA conference just happened this, past, this week, actually. Brad, I think you just got back yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I got many texts and, and text messages from uh, Brad and the team that we won even more awards at the FPTA conference. So I just wanted to share those with you really quickly. Um, the first award, uh, next slide please, is we, um, won our first place FPTA award for a special event, our electric bus fleet expansion. So I'm sure many of you remember this event, about half of PSTA's fleet now being electric or hybrid. We unveiled four new electric buses on February 1st, and the goal of the event was to position PSTA as innovative and a sustainable agency. The cleaner air vehicle wraps were an outstanding example of the inter intersection of great design and compelling information and promoted sustainable transit system awareness. Next slide, and this is the last video I promise, just to remind you of this first place award event. This is not just an electrifying day for PSTA, it is a day that Pinellas County can celebrate. These buses will help bring a cleaner air for all of us. Once these buses hit the road, the community and visitors of Pinellas County will recognize that we're doing our part to reduce our carbon footprint and help create a better tomorrow. 
adding more electric vehicles to our transit fleet. That's how we're going to move the citizens of our city and our county forward to reduce our carbon footprint. So welcoming six new electric buses to our city and our region makes perfect sense. Innovation drives not only PSTA, but Pinellas County forward. And PSTA has been at the forefront of that. These six buses constitute the largest electric fleet in the state. And this is only the beginning. These quiet and smooth riding electric buses will deliver big benefit and a clean environment. And that's why it's so crucial that PSTA helps to lead this community into a cleaner, greener future. We have the first inductive wireless charger for buses on the east coast of Florida. But we're not stopping there. Every project, every service, and every initiative that we will have now are viewed through a sustainability lens and assessed for its contribution and impact on our community, our environment, our economy, and the future. Another great job for a first place award. Congratulations, everyone. And then real quickly, uh, we won second place in our interior exterior signage for our Black History Month Driving Diversity Bus Wrap. So we typically developed a tradition of participating in the Dream Big MLK Parade, but due to COVID-19 in 2021, uh, it was virtual, of course. But nonetheless, PSTA partnered with a local artist to wrap one of our vehicles to show our support for the community during Black History Month. And our goals through the campaign were to show that we are proud to be a diverse and inclusive agency, our dedication to minority-owned businesses, and an advocate for minority communities. And our last uh, award announcement is we received third place for overall campaign, again, for our AVA campaign. And the last thing I just want to mention is on the, the, very, the next slide is we have a brand new refreshed marketing team. We've hired uh, a lot of new people on the marketing team, so I wanted to kind of give you a little introduction to who they are. And I'm really looking forward to the talent that we've brought on board, and I'm just expecting us to bring even more awards home next year. So thank you all for your support for all of these events and projects that we do, and we're happy to continue to bring awards home to PSTA. All right, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Whitney? Next week, right? Two more weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. Nah, next week. <laughs> Mr. Long. Thank Oops. you, Madam Wait a minute, Chair. wait a minute. Wait so, a minute. Whitney, I just wanted to point out uh, how much work and time and effort went into the branding of our new electric buses and how much we focused on the colors and the trying to bring the sunshine and our environment here and this beautiful paradise we all live in. And I have to say, you know, if you're from another part of the United States and we've all traveled around and see what the bus colors are, not only in our country, but around the world, it really does pop. Mm -hmm. And I, I cannot help but wonder and imagine how our many, many tourists that come here to visit must be so thrilled when they see those beautiful buses because they really stand out in our community. So congratulations and good luck with your new baby. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we Thank didn't you. notice anything. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kitchen seals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now it's time for the consent agenda. Do we have any items that anybody wants to pull? Okay. Roll consent, Madam Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Second. Uh, second from Commissioner Sarecki. All right, can you open the voting thing, please? Thank you. Oh, shoot. I'm a yes. <laughs> okay. Is that Is that everyone? Uh, yeah. 13. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we're, we have, oh, sorry. Okay. 
Okay. Right. Okay. Um, now we have committee committee updates. We're going to see re updates from track for Pinellas and T. Barta, and we'll start with track chairman Duncan Kovar. Welcome. Hi again. I'm Duncan Kovar, current chair of the Transit Riders Committee, always representing the Tampa Bay Post Carbon Council as well. And I thank you for your attention. I'll remind you this is my second to last uh, time before you that I'll be termed off. So I'll ask you all to please be looking around and encouraging if you know neighbors, riders, to get them to uh, join the Riders Committee. Um, we always need transit riders to, to help the board. Um, good morning. We had a very short meeting. We had just two items and uh, very inspiring. Uh, we got the presentation you guys did last month. Where's Henry Lukasik and uh, where's our CFO? Debbie was here. Uh, we received the uh, presentation about the, deploy the uh, deployment of the new trolleys and the grant dollars to roll over the fleet. What was most about, if I can give you an impression, is that when people join track, they're just riders. Their biggest concern was, my stop was dirty, my bus was late, my driver was nice or bad. But when they sit on track, they start learning about funding, they start learning about planning, they start learning about integration to the forward Pinellas, and you really see them grow. And uh, then the, the other thing is we ask them to become ambassadors and take that information out, put it on Facebook, tell their neighbors. And that's why uh, track is such a good utility. So a great presentation about the, uh, the update from the uh, aging fleet and the federal, present, uh, the federal grants, which I find fascinating and I watch that whole group. Uh, learn a lot. The other presentation was from Whitney uh, about the new logos, the new wraps. I think you guys have seen that already. And again, those were thoughts that the average writer had never thought about but started to see that you guys are on the ball and really appreciate it. You could see all that. So if you know more other, uh, other folks that you can get, let me talk to the, to the uh, internet. Please, if you ride PSTA and have time to commit, you'll learn a lot and, it'll, it, and you help a lot. Our next meeting is uh, Tuesday, November 16th. It will be my last meeting. It is via Zoom. And uh, please put your name in to join uh, the board. You guys are always welcome. It's just a Zoom meeting. We really appreciate uh, helping. Thank you. Okay. Can, thank you. Any questions for Duncan? Thank you, Duncan. Nope. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, next up, uh, Commissioner Long. We have a forward Pinellas report. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh. Um, so our Forward Pinellas Board met in person on October 13th, and the board approved the scope for a target employment industrial land study. The goal of the study is to ascertain whether the current supply of land that could accommodate target employment in the county is, suffi is sufficient to fulfill the needs of existing and potential target employers over the next 20 years and identify the most effective strategies to achieve that goal. The study is an update of a prior one that was done in 2008 that set a policy framework for Pinellas County to preserve industrial and employment land. The outcomes from the study could have a profound effect on the Sunrunner Station area development, especially in the 22nd Street corridor. The board also approved amendments to the TIP requested by the Florida Department of Transportation to include design funding for several lane continuity improvements along I-275 and additional express lanes from 54th Avenue North to north of 4th Street North. The board approved our legislative priorities for more flexible transportation funding programs for large urban areas which complements PSTA's priorities. A target and collaborative approach to safety and keeping <clears throat> communities strong and independent while working to solve bigger challenges such as affordable housing in combination with transit services. 
it's not too late to register for the 2021 Gulf Coast Safe Streets Hybrid Summit. We're excited to announce our keynote speaker is Robin Hutchison, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety Policy at the United States Department of Transportation. You can register today at www.gulfcoastsafestreetsummit.org slash register. PSTA staff will be participating in several sessions, including an overview of the Track Start Award and the participation of riders in the agency decision-making process, plus a mobile tour of the Sunrunner BRT construction. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's the end of my report. Okay, thank you. And we have a T-bar to report from Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we had a very interesting meeting and an exciting meeting since we had a quorum, <laughs> something that we've okay. uh, found a little difficult to do. Um, some of you may have uh, uh, be reminded of the report I gave previously where we um, voted to allow representatives from the mayor's offices to represent them if they couldn't make it, and so that is really helping. Um, Mr. Dingfelder is the representative for uh, Mayor Jane Castor, and I think Councilmember Deborah Fix Sanders will be the representative for Mayor Richard Kreisman for the city of St. Petersburg throughout the balance of his term, and hopefully she'll be able to remain after then. Um, we uh, welcomed a new commissioner, uh, Ms. Kim Overman, so we're excited to have her on board. She serves on HART, the HART Transportation Board, so hopefully she'll be bringing some of that information and we can begin to really collaborate on the expansion of regional transportation which is inclusive of the heart services. Um, we received an update from Ken Bowden regarding several upcoming events to include the FDOT Mobility Week, which begins October 29th and that ends on November 5th. Um, in that same vein, we were provided with a presentation um, regarding a new app called Move It. Um, and it's an app that utilizes both a QR <coughs> code and a scan code, um, but it allows for persons who utilize those cards to get the information pretty much what we already have here and I stated that with PSTA when it comes to being able to check how long it will be before your bus arrives. Yeah. Being able to upload um, funds onto your card to transport. The concern that I had and what I raised was we want to make sure that move it, the MoveIt system is compatible to the Flamingo system which is what many of us already have. And I also expressed uh, a little concern with just utilizing the QR code only because you have some seniors who may not be able to line it up just right or persons who are visually challenged. Um, if your lighting is not just right on your cell phone, that could be an issue as well. So there needs to be a two-way opportunity for that. For the RRT project update, um, staff is requesting from FTA a class of action that will identify the level of the environmental analysis required for the project. We want to make sure that we're doing everything in order. Um, staff will also submit the NEPA checklist on October 22nd, and we hope to have a categorical exclusion based on those environmental, um, that environmental analysis. Um, we also uh, passed something that I think uh, will be very helpful and beneficial to T. Barter's bottom line, as long as it passes um, the city councils uh, within those cities. Um, but some people did not realize, I was one of them, that the city of Tampa and city of St. Petersburg was not paying into t -Barta, much like we have many um, municipalities that pay into PSTA. Um, and so um, I did meet with staff as the Secretary of Treasury, and we talked about a couple of uh, analysis that we could use to try to come up with a figure that would be acceptable, <laughs> but would also um, allow those cities to pay what we call their fair share. Um, and so what we decided on, what we voted on was a uh, per capita amount of 0.17% um, of the budget for Pinellas and for the city of Tampa. So for um, Pinellas, that amount would be, or St. Petersburg, I'm sorry, um, that amount would be $45,526.34. And for Tampa, that would be $69,291.83. So if you add that into what Hernando, Hillsborough, Manatee, Pasco, and Pinellas County governments are already paying, that brings us uh, to a collective total of $722,565.62. Um, 
we are uh, working on forecasting what our revenues and expenditures will be for the 2023 budget season um, because we have a lot of projects on the line and we also have some grants that are out there but they're not included in the figure I'm about to give you. Um, but it appears as though we will be in a positive um, financial position. <clears throat> um, our operating expense forecast is uh, $1.25, $1.2 million um, and our expenditures would be right in line with that. Um, our revenues would be around $1.3 million, um, and so that would give us about $85,000 in net surplus. Um, so that would be, again, if in fact um, we receive all of the funds that we are hoping to receive from, um, to include the city of St. Petersburg and the city of Tampa. We also um, voted to move forward with an ask from the state. We know that we made it through the House, we made it through the Senate, and it was vetoed um, by the governor. But we uh, did vote uh, with caution. I want to uh, recognize that we did have some caution, um, words of caution brought to us. But we decided that um, if you don't ask, you don't get. And so the worst that could happen is, is that the ask be denied. But we are hopeful. We do know that Senator Brandes has already put forth his legislation as it relates to um, disbanding T. Barta. Uh, we are very grateful for Senator uh, Will Simpson and others who stepped up on the last session, um, and we are hopeful that they will do that again. So uh, we're moving forward in that direction. We also um, will be going up to, hopefully we'll be going up to D.C. Uh, to kind of talk about some of the things that we're doing and um, encourage additional funding for all of our projects that we have on the board. Um, state Advocacy Services, RSA is hoping to secure state funds to match all of our local contributions. Um, and if we receive those match funds, that'll put us even in a better financial position. That is all I have to report. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Commissioner Flowers? No, okay. Madam Chair? Yes. I don't have a question. Oh. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have an additional committee update, um, if I may. Okay, so. Please. The uh, Forward Pinal School Transportation Safety Committee met October 6th. Um, it only meets three times a year, so it's hard to uh, remember when to put it back on the agenda. Um, and in this case, we actually have, there's some uh, interesting developments. Uh, a lot of the conversations centered around uh, COVID-related transportation issues. So lack of school bus drivers and a, a larger issue of um, parents driving their kids to school, but instead of using the car circles, which can take too long, dropping their kids off in neighborhoods. Um, and then the kids walking in an unsafe way to school. Um, the committee wasn't accepting of a lot of different ideas on how to make that better, um, and, and some, some members of the committee just was, were hoping that it would just cure itself as, uh, as, as time went on. But one of the exciting things that did come out of that, I should also mention um, one of the other concerns was um, especially in the elementary school, there are some kids that are on uh, two hour bus rides at the end of school, so they're not getting home till after five o'clock, uh, missing other activities as they combine routes because they have a lack of drivers. Um, but um, I believe it's gonna be starting in January. I don't know if we've completed the, the, the deal. Um, there's a pilot program to have PSTA help with routing for uh, three high schools to um, get those students on the, on the PSTA bus. Interestingly, um, there's already a lot of students that take PSTA, um, more than I think the school district would like to admit or, or, or recognize. Um, so having a pilot program where one, we get funds in from the school to help cover that, um, and, and we can help with our policies and procedures to make that smoother, um, will we'll serve the entire community. So we're looking forward to the start of that project and then hopefully an update on how that's going in March at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our first action item is to approve the recommended 2022 federal legislative priorities. And I believe we have um, Harry Glenn and Steve Palmer from Van Skoyek on line here. Uh, Brad, would you like to um, take us through this item? Yes. Good morning, everybody. So at your places is um, the recommended federal priorities for PSTA for 2022. We're kind of copying exactly what we did last month with our state legislative priorities. And I want to thank um, Commissioners Jamie Robinson and Dan Saraki for joining me on what I think has turned out to be a really successful 
uh, first trip to Tallahassee, where we took this one pager like this for the state priorities and went around and got our delegation to support us. Hopefully, as Commissioner Flowers said, someday we'll be able to go back to Washington, D.C. and take this lovely uh, document with us. Um, but in the meantime, Harry and Steve are there uh, advocating on our behalf. As you can see, it's a fairly simple priority list. Number one is, of course, our number one until it gets funded, as uh, Commissioner Albright knows, is the Clearwater Transit Center. And hopefully we'll find out some good news in, in just about a month um, on, on number one. <coughs> number two and number three, as you know, as you might probably know, in um, Washington, I think all things, including transportation, has a, has a kind of every five years that Congress approves authorization bill, which kind of sets policy, and then every year they approve the budget, which is appropriations. And so two is the authorization bill that they're t discussing now, and three is the appropriations. And then four is sort of the existing funding that Congress has already approved and our priorities on trying to get various grants, including the Clearwater Transit Center as number one. So I'll just stop there and ask Harry and Steve, I think we're reading about it in the paper every single day about what's going on with these bills, but maybe they have the latest and greatest. Hi, Brad, it's, uh, it's Harry, thanks for that. Um, Sorry we can't be there in person. We actually hope to have good news for you today that maybe the House had passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but that didn't happen. And we'll let Steve give an update on that. So as Brad said, um, it kind of this kind of dovetails with your uh, legislative priorities, but Congress is trying to wrap up its work for the year. And as Brad mentioned, it's kind of in two different buckets. One is the big infrastructure bills you're reading so much about. And then the second is the regular appropriations process. So I'll let Steve lead off because all the news right now is about what's happening with infrastructure. We can give you an update on that and then I'll talk to you a bit about the appropriations process. Great. Thank you, Harry and uh, Brad, and thank you members of the uh, board. It, it's, uh, it's repetitive to say they're negotiating and we're hopeful that they can have this bill wrapped up, but it's possible they think, according to Speaker Pelosi in the House, they could have an agreement as early as today or tomorrow on the, the larger human infrastructure bill, the one they're calling the Build Back Better Act, Started out by President Biden's proposal of three and a half trillion. They're now down to somewhere around 1.75 trillion, so about half that much. More to the point for PSTA is there is a, in the original proposal, there was a $10 billion transit to, to affordable housing uh, grant program, which it was a one year grant program. So a $10 billion, uh, $10 billion to be allocated in one year is significant. You know, I've, I've been told that is a part of that is still in the bill. We just don't know how much of it is. It could be much smaller. It could be a third if the if you if you believe uh, some of the things I've heard. That bill uh, is there. The Progressive Caucus is holding up because of that bill until it's finalized, holding up the five year bipartisan infrastructure bill, which, as Brad just mentioned, does include the five year uh, surface transportation authorization bill. That is ready to go once, once the bigger bill is negotiated out, there's, a, there's an agreement that bill will pass the House and go on to the president. He asked that it be done by today. I don't think it's gonna happen by today, but maybe next week. If it doesn't happen by Sunday, the surface transportation authorization bill expires, the current uh, authority to expend money expires, and Congress is talking about extending that again. They extended it for one month to October 31st, they're now talking about extending it to December 3rd, which is uh, consistent with the continuing resolution for appropriation. So with that, it's a segue that I'll turn it over to Harry and he can talk about the fiscal 22 appropriations process. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, let me, and I'll back up to Steve for one other thing. Another two items of interest that we're tracking uh, for PSTA, as you will recall in some of our earlier conversations, Congress um, brought back the process, whatever you want to call it now. It used to be called congressional earmark spending. Now they call it congressionally directed uh, funding projects. Um, as you may remember, Congressman Christ has been really helpful on his staff this year in including two congressionally directed projects in, in this fiscal year. One is, is in the appropriations process. I'll talk about that in a minute. The other one, which is a $6 million project to provide solar energy for, at your PSTA headquarters for uh, your, your charging of the electric bus fleet. It was in the House passed version of the infrastructure, highway infrastructure bill. 
that Steve talked about. And um, not to get too confusing here, but the, as you may recall, the Senate took the House bill and amended the infrastructure bill and deleted all of the House uh, earmarked projects and sent the bill back to the House. That's the bill that's sitting, has been sitting August waiting for the House to vote. And I, I'm going to pass it over to Steve because he's the expert on this. There is a provision in the, in the larger people infrastructure bill that talk, Steve talked about that's still being negotiated that would try, would take the first step to try and uh, bring those earmarked projects to life again in the House. Steve, do you want to talk about that? Because it does have a bearing on, on the PSTA project. It, it does, and Harry, you're right. It is very confusing. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the earmarks are still alive, even though they're not specified in legislation. There's a placeholder that uh, Chairman Peter DeFazio, the Transportation Committee Chair, inserted into the Human Infrastructure Bill. Uh, there were about a little under $6 billion worth of earmarks. So that's pending, including the earmark for the uh, PSD at charging uh, station. They're not specified, so there's gonna, it's going to take some work. The, uh, Chairman DeFazio has said, I've heard him talk to his staff, and he's committed to try to get them done into law, pass, passed into law, which would be good for PSDA. If not, he's committed to uh, working with uh, Secretary Buttigieg to get them funded through all of this competitive grant funding that will be uh, made available through the infrastructure bill. So even though they're not front and center on either of these bills, there is a process that I think we're going to keep advocating for to try to get them uh, finalized and then the project funded. So I think, Brad, on, on your legislative agenda, one of the items is infrastructure infrastructure investment jobs. And not only is enactment of that legislation important, but also chasing the funds that are in there and maybe available PSTA is going to be critically important over the next year. And so that's one of the things that Steve and I'll be working with on uh, for you. Uh, the other issue to update, as I mentioned, is the regular appropriations process. As you all may recall, Congress um, every year uh, has to adopt 12 separate appropriations bills to fund each of the various departments and agencies within the federal government. The House has passed nine of the 12 bills. Uh, the Senate hasn't passed any yet. Three have gotten through the committee. Uh, they've reported uh, documentation last week on nine other ones. So they're kind of, the process is moving forward. Uh, the Congress, the federal government's operating under a continuing funding resolution uh, that keeps the government open and running through December 3rd. Probably going to have to extend that probably till later in December so they can get their work done. All the focus, as Steve mentioned, is on this these infrastructure bills right now. Uh, the good news in the, in the appropriations front is that Congressman Christ also included a project in the regular transportation appropriations bill for PST. It's a $1.2 million uh, earmark project to provide uh, inline chargers at the, your St. Petersburg and Clearwater stations so that uh, the electric buses that pass through there can charge up uh, during the day. That's an important project. Uh, those projects are in pretty good shape. Uh, the House has said to indicate if it's in one bill or the other, that it'll stay in the final conference report. The, the goal now is to get the bills across the finish line and uh, and into law. They'll probably have to incorporate all 12 in the one omnibus appropriations bill, and hopefully they get that done before the Christmas holiday. So we continue to track that. Uh, as part of your process, Congress will begin work in, in February on the next round of appropriations bills for fiscal year 23. Uh, we fully expect that Steve would agree, I think, that congressional earmark spending will return again next year for another round. And so we'll be working with uh, Brad and the staff to identify other good projects that might be able to be incorporated in, in the next round of appropriations bill. So uh, that'll be something else um, we want to do there. So there's a lot of things up in the air. Hopefully um, these things get wrapped up here in the next couple of weeks and we'll continue to track those. Brad, I don't know, do you want us to comment on the, on the federal legislative priorities too at this point? I, I think that was... Okay. I think that so, was good. Um, it's just to go through the priorities uh, on the raise grant uh, as uh, directed by the, the board legislative committee and Brad, we are working with Congressman Christ, who is has made a request for to set up a call with Secretary Buttigieg, the uh, Secretary of Transportation, to put in one last pitch for the raise grant application for the Clearwater Transit Center. Uh, and so uh, hopefully that I know Secretary Buttigieg, Steve can probably confirm this is has been busy over the last couple of weeks trying to promote the infrastructure bill to try and encourage Congress to get that across the goal line. So, but Congressman Chris just updated us this morning that uh, the, the call, the, the request is in and they're optimistic that they will 
get a call done uh, very soon here. So we'll let you know how that goes. Um, on the infrastructure bills, we mentioned, Steve gave you the update on that. As we said, I think the important thing here on your, on your priority list is once these bills become law, uh, there's significant amount of funding, particularly in the highway infrastructure bill for transit and transportation projects. Uh, as an example of the, the low no bus uh, program, I know Whitney talked earlier about the great work you're doing to electrify your fleet. Uh, there's about usually about $50 million a year for low no bus grants. Um, under the infrastructure bill, that will increase to over $150 million a year in competitive funding for low no buses. So there'll be lots of opportunity for uh, new buses, uh, bus and bus facility grants, and it'll be important to uh, chase those uh, application periods when they open and make sure that you have all the information you need to submit competitive applications. As we mentioned, a priority three was appropriations. Not only do we want to see this year's appropriations bills uh, signed into law and the project for the inline charges, um, uh, the funds awarded the PSTA, but we want to start looking forward to next year and, and what Congress has in mind for next year and, and come up with some good projects to share with a delegation uh, that would support PSTA. And then uh, priority four is to, as I mentioned earlier, chase the funds that the regular funds that are going to be available to PSTA to apply for plus the enhanced funding through the infrastructure bill. And there are some new uh, programs, depending on how these infrastructure bills play out, that would be new to, P to PSTA to support uh, getting people to work uh, better, uh, providing more climate friendly transportation alternatives and to sustain the uh, provide more sustainable transportation uh, and transportation infrastructure for our area. And so we will work with you and, and, and the staff to make sure you're aware of all those uh, new competitive opportunities as they come available and to try and make sure that, as you say, return to Washington for visits, that we get the appropriate meetings with the uh, USDOT and the FTA staff and members of Congress to talk about what PS, PST is trying to do. So with that, Brad, we're happy to answer any questions uh, that the board may have. <clears throat> Mr. Flowers. Thank you. Um, good morning, um, Harry and, and staff. Thank you so much for that. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding the um, request for special appropriations. So those things that either counties or PSTA or other organizations submitted to its um, uh, House member for us, it was Congressman Chris. Um, in order for them to try to get that through, they want to put the dollar value in, but just take away the specific naming of each project since those specific projects were removed from the budget on the Senate side. And then if it passes, they would go back to reallocate those funds, or would that have to be a, a, grant, a competitive grant award process? Maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. No, Commissioner, you're, you're exactly right. It's very confusing. Uh, it's not entirely clear how it will work. Um, the, the earmarks were in the House passed infrastructure bill. Right. That bill is dead. Right. Um, the chairman of the committee in the House is trying to keep those earmarks alive any way that he can. They put a placeholder in to say we want our earmarks, but they're not specified. They're not listed. Okay into the into the uh the, the bigger uh human infrastructure bill it's not entirely clear if that became law today how they, they would be treated i think they'd get but but we we have heard that they might be given priority by the u.s department of transportation in any kind of grant making process if not uh the chairman of the transportation committee will probably then look for another piece of legislation to attach them to because he's committed to try to get those enacted so even once it's attached to that legislation and if it passes, then it's just kind of finding the cure about how you process that through. Okay. Correct. Thank you. And, and Commissioner, I don't know, Steve, one of the things that they could do is um, so essentially what they're doing is they're going to, if they're going to put a dollar figure in this big people infrastructure bill they're talking about, the Build Back America, the Build Back Better legislation, they'll put in a slug of money, $6 billion is what the estimate is. In the bill so the money would be made available and then the question is how do they distribute the money one of the options steve could be that they could list the projects as steve said in other legislation that could be the omnibus appropriations bill they could add a separate chapter and just let's list all the projects like the six million dollars for psta in there and that would and then it would become simply a grant making uh, uh opportunity for psta now the, just to clarify uh commissioner flowers 
The other project that we talked about, the $1.2 million project for the inline chargers, that's in the appropriations bills. And that's, that's I think, on a more steady state right now. I think just got to get those bills signed into law. And then that money will be come directly from FTA to PSTA. We're not, they haven't done earmarks for 11 years. So the actual process of getting the earmark money from the USDOT to the recipients like PSTA, that'll could it be a bit of a challenge for the first time in 11 years, but we'll, we'll track that and make sure it gets done. So that one, I think, is in really good shape. It's the other one we really have to track for you. I remember the bill based on Congressman Bill Young was very, very creative and very good about getting us some of those earmark funds. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Bye, Thanks for everything Thank you, all. you up Thank there. You. Thank you. Well, and Madam Chair, the uh, PSA Legislative Committee reviewed this and uh, unanimously recommended it. Okay, great. Um, okay, then. Do we have anybody in the lobby or online that would like to comment? There are no public comments from the lobby. Okay. And none online? There are no public comments on the line. Thank you. All right, do I have a motion to approve the 2022 legislative priorities? Second. Who, I'm sorry, I missed who made the motion. David. Okay, great. All Britain and uh, Long. Can you bring up the voting screen, please? Yes. <laughs> okay, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see. The last action item is to approve contracts to purchase electric buses. And Henry Lukasik, Director of Maintenance, and Al Burns, highly motivated Director of Procurement, will present this <laughs> item. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, Al Burns, as you said, your highly motivated Procurement Director. Um, I'm so excited and humbled to be here this morning um, before you. Um, PSTA was asked to lead the procurement for the first electric bus procurement for the state. And that's a huge honor, and it was a huge undertaking, and I'd like to walk you through that process this morning. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, first off, I want to give a shout out to my staff, um, specifically Ms. Edith Randall. She worked tires tirelessly with me on this procurement and she put up with my temperament from time to time while, while going through this process. So I just wanna thank her and tell her how much I appreciate her hard work. Um, as Whitney said, we just came back last, last night from the FPTA conference in Daytona Beach. And it was very, very refreshing for smaller agencies to come up to PSTA and say, hey, great job, and we're so appreciative that you guys led the procurement. Because a lot of the smaller agencies don't have the resources to be able to, uh, to do an undertaking such as this. Uh, RFP is, pool, is designed, um, a state schedule is designed to pool all of our resources together. And the ultimate goal is to get um, competition and competitive pricing. And this morning, Ms. Um, Madam Chair, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to tell you we got both of those. Next slide, please. So FPTA stands for Florida Public Transportation Association. It con consists of over 40 transit agencies all here in the state of Florida. And like I said before, PSTA was asked to lead the state procurement for this. And it was, it was a very, very challenging task. Um, our state is one of the largest in the country, and it took a lot of resources and a lot of coordination and a lot of logistics to make this happen. But we had to put together, um, next slide, but we had to put together a specification, and my colleague, Mr. Henry Lukasik, he'll walk us through how we, um, the methodology for developing the scope of work or the, tech, the technical specs. Henry? Thank you, Al. So when we talk about a bus, 
and developing specifications, it's just a little bit more than saying we want a bus. And uh, it's actually a quite lengthy document. Um, fortunately for us, the American Public Transit Association, which we refer to as APA, APTA, long time ago put together a template document uh, to assist both transit agencies, us the consumers, and the bus manufacturers who we purchase them from, to come to an agreement that this will be a standardized template and with standardization comes consistency, what we want and what they build for us. That document's been around for well over a decade and things have changed. So what we needed to do for this particular solicitation was to modify it. Modify it for zero emission vehicles, namely all electric buses. I could not do this myself, contrary to popular belief, so I had to bring in help from my colleagues, other directors of maintenance from Tallahassee all the way down to Miami. And after that process this was complete, we are pleased to say that we accomplished the mission. In our specifications, we asked for the gamut of bus sizes from 30 feet all the way to 60 foot articulating buses. Now one of the challenges of the specifications of this document was not all battery electric buses are the same. They have six wheels and they carry people, but when we think about battery electric buses, we have to think about uh, onboard battery capacity, range requirements, passenger loads, battery technology, chemistry, all these wonderful things that go into an all-electric bus. We did not want to put out a restrictive specification at all. I'm actually happy to say that some of the conversation that I had at FPTA yesterday from the vendor network was that this RFP was the most, quote, open specification out there right now. In fact, this person was so bold to say that this solicitation might serve as the role model and example for all future battery electric bus uh, solicitations in the future. That was quite a compliment. Now because battery electric buses, there's a lot of designs that are inherent to the particular manufacturers. So part of what we wanted to do was to put together specifications that relied more on technical narratives, as you can see. Now just a couple of examples. These were questions that we posed to the bus manufacturers so that they could provide the most information they could. And just to mention a couple of them, these were expected range profiles, these were propulsion system technology, battery composition, all of the things I've mentioned, so that at the end of the day, any transit agency, whether it be in Florida or whether it be all over this country, can pour over the proposals that were received and can look through the copious amounts of information and choose the best bus for their particular agency, what they want to do with it, and for their needs. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk about the review process. A solicitation or a procurement of this size and this magnitude, I wanted to make sure that it was vetted by everyone. So I sent the solicitation to FTA. FTA reviewed it and provided comment. FDOT, they reviewed it and provided comment. Cutter, Center of Urban Transportation Research, they reviewed it and provided comment. Trans Transit Maintenance Analysis and Resource Center, Florida Trans Transit Maintenance Consortium that Henry just spoke about, they reviewed it. And our general counsel, Brian Miller Olive, they reviewed it. And Madam Chair, I am so happy that this was a rock solid procurement. There were, there were some comments, but nothing of substance that we weren't able to change before the solicitation hit the street and agencies across the state and country will be able to uh, buy off of this contract if approved. Next slide. As Henry said, we did not do this alone. And we didn't want to do it alone. As it being a Florida, a Florida schedule, we wanted to make sure that all the transit agencies, not all, but 
some, um, the some of the transit agencies were able to provide feedback. And they did that in the form of sitting on the evaluation um, committee, and I would like to have the opportunity to acknowledge them. First, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Henry Lukasik, Director of Maintenance for PSTA. Joseph Cheney, Deputy Maintenance Director for PSTA. Walter Kirkland, Maintenance Director of Star Metro. Elvis Devalis, Maintenance Director of Lynx in Orlando. Jim Cribbs, Maintenance Director of Palm Tran in Palm Beach. William Campbell, Maintenance Director of Miami Day Transit. We also had eyes watching this. So Cutter, Todd Parson from Cutter, Carlton Allen from Cutter, and Tony Brandon from FDOT. So you can tell that we had a very, very, and there's a um, depiction of, the, of Florida on the screen. And we had pretty much a representative from almost every region in the state. Next slide, please. The pricing schedule. At the Finance Committee, we went over the pricing schedule and the methodology of that, and so I'll keep it very, very brief. At the end of the day, um, PSTA, my, myself and my staff, we looked at pricing from several other state schedules, California, Washington State, State of Virginia, Georgia. And the reason we wanted to pull, um, look at the state schedules from these other states is because we wanted to make sure that we receive competitive pricing. And I am so glad to let you know, Madam Chair, that the pricing we see, receive is very, very, very competitive. This is a five-year contract that we're bringing before you. And it is, the first year is a base, is the base price stays the same. And we have the escalation anchored to a PPI or a producer price index category 14, 13, truck and bus bodies. I want to look at this solicitation, not only from a procurement perspective, but also what happens after, if um, the board awards these contracts. How are people going to be able to order off of these contracts? You've seen us come before you before, Madam Chair, ordering vehicles from the state of Virginia. Well, that's a very, very tedious process where you look at the state schedule and you highlight and you use Excel and a notepad. So I had a vision. And the person that helped me with that vision is our very own, the wizard. And the wizard's name is Nicholas Sagan from our finance department. Nick, if I could be so bold to ask you to, to walk through the dashboard that you created um, with the board. Next slide, please. Thanks, Al, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as Al said, my name's Nick Sagan, uh, budget analyst. I work with Michael and his group. Uh, let me share my screen for you so we can see what we're working with here. Um, let's see. Should be, should be good. All right, can you all see my, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this is just a quick overview of this dashboard. We're going to zoom in here. Not that much. I'm just going to scroll way up. So let's pretend I'm PSDA and I'm buying a bus. Uh, we have a budget amount we'll start with of like a million dollars. Uh, then we would select a vendor here. Uh, you just click a button. We're going to go with New Flyer. And below that, you would just pick every single component that you want to go with. Uh, so we'll, we'll pick a few uh, like advertising frames, an air system, uh, a depot charger. Can't forget a base bus, so let's go get that. So let's get a base bus, uh, you know, batteries. Keep scrolling through and picking a couple more and see what we got. Uh, we'll take a fire suppression system and uh, interior lights. Okay, great. So let's see what the damage is. So if we scroll to the right, way up here, you'll see a uh, cost breakdown of everything we selected. It tells you the quantities, uh, you know, your total by component. Uh, and, and so that's a lot of great information. But to the right of that, we have some visualizations breaking it down even more. So 
Now you can see what's the biggest chunk of change on that. Uh, it's the base bus and followed by that's the, the depot charger here. Uh, so you can see the weight represented there. And then below we have a bar chart that we built kind of to show you where you are compared to the budget amount that you started with. So we're about $200,000 over, but this gives you a good representation of, of all that. So we'll zoom out and just give you another quick look what this looks like. So there it is, everything included. Uh, we, we think that this is going to be a, a great tool for transit agencies to use. Uh, it's quick, efficient, uh, dynamic. It, it shows a whole lot all at once as you're updating it. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to Al. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dick. So, Madam Chair, this morning, um, I bring before you the action is approve awarding five-year contracts for all electric bus transit buses with charging and associated equipment as a Florida State schedule to, next slide, BYD, Gillig, New Flyer, and Proterra. At the Finance Committee, there were representatives from all of the OEMs, which is a, which is a feat all, all of its own. And I could tell you that this was unanimously passed um, by, the finance, by the Finance Committee. And if there's any questions, Henry and I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you for your time this morning. I just have one question. Um, can you explain what the benefit was for us to go to all this work to develop this proposal for the whole state? That's an excellent question. Um, I'll be selfish to glory. That's, that's one benefit. But also, this is a revenue generating opportunity for FPTA. All of, all, there's a, a fee for buying um, vehicles or buses off of this schedule. And every, every agency has to pay that fee, except the, the lead agency, which is PSTA. And knowing that we're going to be electrifying our fleet, that is going to be a cost savings on its own um, right there. The proceeds that are used, um, that the, re the proceeds from the revenue is used for the training of our maintenance, of our maintenance staff in various initiatives across the state from a public trans um, transit perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do your... Okay, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Driscoll. Thank <laughs> you. First. Sorry, I know. I know. Thank you. And um, for PSTA to be asked by FPTA to be the lead agency on this really says a lot. Um, about PSTA, but specifically about the work that you do. So I wanted to congratulate you on um, being recognized in that way. And sometimes that means that we're asked to do extra work, right? But it's well worth it. And um, I'm really happy that this is coming together because not only does it help with costs, but it's really going to help with um, spreading opportunities for electric buses to other agencies as well. So there is... Um, a fantastic ripple effect that comes with this. Seeing that you have, so there are multiple, um, you've got four different companies that are within this, this contract. So when an agency goes to buy out of this, out of this program, do they get to select which company they go with? How does, how does that process work? Because you've got four, so let's say somebody, you know, if an agency wants to buy, have you already screened them? Do we, are we still involved? How does that work? Um, first off, thank you for the um, compliment, um, Commissioner Driscoll. Um, I came from the private sector before I came into public service. And it was all about, you know, stock options and things of that nature when I was in the private sector. And now I'm in the public sector. And it's so refreshing to see your hard work actually affect the community. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm in the public sector um, now. But to answer your question as far as um, how does the agency go about buying, 
Um, we're, for example, we're a Gillick shop. Majority of our fleet are Gillick, um, besides the hometown trolleys and, and some of the BYDs. So um, Henry and the maintenance consortium, and it, they developed a spec where it was so, it wasn't um, tailored for the needs of specifically for a PSTA. And what I mean by that, Miami, um, Miami and Lynx, they have um, Proteras in their fleet and new flyers in their fleet. So they'll be able to buy what, what fits for their agency. A, um, a transit agency where I came from, Indianapolis, Indigo. Um, they, well, they're actually a Gillick shop as well. But with the specifications being writ written so broadly, they'll be able to buy off of this schedule provided they pay the fee, um, they'll be able to um, buy off of the schedule as well. So it was tailored in such a way that um, any agency that has a need for electric buses are able to buy it, but also because of what their fleet consists of, parts, you know, that's a huge aftermarket, I mean, after the big um, bus buy, you have to have spares in your fleet. If you, we already have Gillick here, so it's easier to buy Gillick parts, et cetera. So that's the benefit, um, and that's how it'll be used. The dashboard that uh, Mr. Sagan showed you, it lists all of the various options, you know, different seats, different wheelchair ramps, different bike racks. So it's tailored in such a way that it should be able to fit uh, pretty much any agency's needs. Okay, so, so the individual agencies get to choose which company they oh, yeah. work with out of that. Yes, ma'am. And they deal directly with them. You don't, we, don't, we don't have to act as the middleman. This is really just there's goes to there, FPTA then. There's, there's very minimal contract administration after the fact. A after your action today, which you're simply just approving that these four company, uh, companies meet the requirements, every transit agency is on their own to I mean, they, they have this pricing schedule that Al has worked out with, with them, but PSA is not really involved at all. Okay. But then when we go to buy, then we don't have to pay the fee to FPTA Correct. as a reward for being the lead agency on this, right? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I love But that it'll part. come back to you um, hopefully next month once Congress maybe does something um, <laughs> that maybe we would buy off these contracts. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Great presentation. I'm so very proud of everyone at PSTA. My question is, I notice in this, um, in the specifications, there's a $49,200 cost in there for the charger. Yeah. On route charger. So my question is, is there any part of that that we can partner with Duke on? Because I thought we were partnering with them on all of our charging stations. Hopefully, yes. <coughs> yes. <laughs> I like that. With partnerships, you get a lot more done. And I'd like me to elaborate further. No, no, not, that was perfecto. Less is more. Commissioner, uh, may I have the follow-up, please, please? And I just want to make sure that I understand it totally. The, the, this is for one bus, right? This, this yeah, model, yes, model here? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So it's a million, the million twelve hundred thousand, that's for one bus? Well, that, that's just a snapshot of the dashboard. Correct. So, so during the budget process, every agency has a, says they're going to budget X amount for for vehicles. Right. So, whatever the budget budgeted amount that an agency has, they'll put in that yellow field there. If it, it probably is going to be like eight hundred thousand, and then they'll be able to list all those various options at the bottom. And like um, Mr. Sagan said, he'll you'll be able to look to the right and see how that lines up with your budget. So. If you, if you go like 900000 you might want to take out that, that particular bike rack and substitute it with no, something no, no. else. I get that. I just, it's, a, it's a ballpark. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So um, my, my other, my other follow-up is as we move along, do we have a 
total number that we're uh, trying to achieve here? PSTA has its, um, its, its totals, yes. We're trying to get 60, 60 buses over the next five years. And then when, De when Debbie makes her proposal to us during the budget cycle, I'm sure she's going to have it right down to the wire about yes. how much it costs versus how much our savings will be in maintenance and not having to buy gas and all of that kind of stuff, right? Y yes, ma'am. Right? <laughs> she's shaking her head. Yes, but uh, <laughs> now we have that, and we've got our goal of 75.5 million, around 30 million dollars short. I have 46.1 million dollars. I'm confident that I have for buses today. So we've got some work to do, which we know will get done. I know. Listen, I just wanted to say one more thing. It is extraordinary how far PSTA has come since way back in the days of green light. And I just could not be more proud that not only within our own region, but throughout the whole United States, we are constantly recognized as the most forward-thinking, <coughs> futuristic, new idea initiatives always coming forth. So it's a testament to you, Brad, and to your leadership team and all the fabulous people that work for PSTA. So thank you very, very much. It's very uh, rewarding to see, actually see these things coming to fruition. Thank you. Commissioner <clears throat> Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the dashboard that we're seeing here, this is not our specific dashboard. It's just a sample. It's just, yes, ma'am, it's oh. just a sample. Okay, so then I don't have a question because <laughs> when, I, when I saw it and I was, you know, carefully looking and I was going to ask about two things that um, I would love to see, but I guess I could share it. Um, I don't know if you've already put this into your thought process, but I would love to see if you have not um, to see those, um, the barrier um, just for consideration. Oh. Only because of yeah. safety, you know, yeah. making sure that our drivers remain safe and then not saying I want anything else to happen, but should another pandemic or something come across, I think that gave a level of, you know, safety, um, a feel of safety for our drivers. Those are included on the schedule, ma'am. Um, Henry made sure that they were included. Thank you, if Mr. you look Henry. at scroll down, it would be in, on the actual dashboard. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Um, that, that was the question that I had, but since it's a sample, don't worry about it. Good job, okay. though. I appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, do we have any public comment? Either from the lobby or online? There are no public comments from the lobby. There are no public comments on the line. All righty. Well, I will entertain a motion then. A move approval the bus contract. of the presented Florida Consortium electric bus contract proposals. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Flowers, second from Commissioner Driscoll. Please open the voting. Thank you. And that is unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Information items. Whitney Fox is back to talk about a brand refresh. <laughs> yes. Hello again, board members. Great to see you again. Um, I'm here to talk to you about our very exciting PSTA brand refresh. So I'd like to start with, uh, next slide please, a fun blast from the past, back when we were called the Central Pinellas Transit Authority. This is what our vehicles looked like back in the 1970s. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you were around during this time. Um, then on the next slide, we in the 80s, <laughs> PSTA was formed. And so was our awesome retro orange logo and this current bus design that you see here on this slide. It wasn't retro back then. Right, right. <laughs> I guess 
you're correct. <laughs> and then in the 2000s, uh, PST went through a major rebranding uh, where today's logo was created. And you will find the swoosh on the bus design, on our older vehicles, and a lot of our materials that we use throughout the agency today. And on the next slide, you'll notice some issues that we've been having with some of our designed, uh, uh, branded design vehicles of the wrong location for the PSTA logo, because if it is covered up with even just a small advertisement, it, of course, is covering our branding on the bus. And then one thing I want to point out is that when we do cover the logo, the logos are, are decals, which are kind of like a sticker that sits on the vehicle. So when we cover um, a logo with an ad, it's kind of like putting a sticker on a sticker. Hmm. So whenever we remove it, it does sometimes damage the decal. And of course, doing that over and over again over time, you'll see a lot of faded logos or faded designs on some of our older vehicles. Next slide. Then I believe it was around 2009, we started to receive our very first hybrid vehicles and that was very exciting at the time. Um, and we created a new look and design called our smart bus for our hybrid vehicles. So instead of our normal blue swoosh, we had this nice green swoosh of course to let people know that it was a more green vehicle with the smart bus design. But you'll notice the decals on the windows on the next slide, again, having issues with any time we would put an advertisement on the vehicles and then removed it, a lot of times it would be hard to keep those decals intact, especially on the windows. And then finally, all of our newer vehicles, our newer hybrids, um, we have this design. It is just a silver bus with the PSTA logo with no design elements to it. So that is a lot of the newer vehicles that you would see today. And on the next slide, I just wanted to show this as an example hmm. for perspective of a very positive media story that we received. Um, and this was the image that they used to represent PSTA uh, in the media story. So uh, this is when we finally said, you know what, I think it might be time for a PSTA brand refresh. I think we need a little bit of a, a facelift when it comes to the way our vehicles look the, and those are what everybody's interacting with day in and day out throughout the county when it comes to PSTA. So we thought about, you know, who we are as a county. <coughs> and we are, of course, a peninsula on a peninsula with some of the world's best beaches and beach towns. And we really felt that our brand needs to symbolize the community in that way. So we took a look at many different designs and we came up with the idea of taking the, the lighter teal color from the PSTA logo and letting that lead a little bit more than our darker blue that used to lead in previous branded items. I also sat with our director of maintenance, of course, Henry, and asked about, okay, what are some issues that your team is having when it comes to maintaining the vehicle design, um, removing advertisements, and how can we keep that uh, in better practice going forward so that it looks the best when it's out on the road. So what we did is we came up with this new design <laughs> with just beautiful, clean, minimal horizontal stripes with the teal color so it really pops. And we moved the PSTA logo to the top of the vehicle so it would not be covered by any advertisements. And we didn't include any kind of decal designs on the windows themselves. So again, giving this nice, clean, branded image for PSTA on the vehicle. Next slide, please. So here's just an example of how it would look around town. Um, we really think that it's going to be a brighter, sunnier, and more welcoming look for our PSTA fleet, for our riders, and for the community. Next slide. So we'd be going from the old fleet, which is our current fleet today, which kind of looks like a little bit of a modge podge of different designs of our vehicles. Next slide, to our new fleet, where every vehicle would look similar and it would be clear that when a PSTA bus drives by, you know that that's a PSTA branded vehicle. Now, we didn't want to just stop there with the buses. We have decided to even go through other materi branded materials at PSTA and give them a little bit of a facelift, such as our letterhead, going from that swoosh design to a more minimalist look. And then even our PowerPoint templates and presentations, we are going from the left, uh, uh, the older design, to the new on the right, with, again, that clean, minimal look, bringing it into the 2020s. 
and even our business cards. So the older version is on the left and our new version on the right, we're even including um, information such as three words on the back of the card that represent PSTA, such as sustainability, equity, and mobility. And then our email signatures will be changing as well. We are also including an option for people to include their pronouns should they choose to do so. And then even our envelopes and our mailing labels. So that's just a sneak peek of everything that we're going to be giving um, a little refresh to when it comes to the PSTA branding. Next slide, please. So how do we plan on making this a reality? I'm sure you're all aware that Henry has a plan of purchasing 60 new buses over the next five years. So every new bus that comes in, we, would hope we will have the new branded look on those vehicles. So they would just come in ready to go, painted with a new look for PSTA. In addition, we're looking at our CIP, identifying savings and other projects so that we can repaint newer buses that we already own from 2018, 2019, and 2020, including all of our electric vehicles as well. So slowly but surely, we're hoping to get to a uniform look that will represent PSTA, again, in a more positive light um, and provide more dignity to our riders and provide more positive sentiment throughout the community. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John. I have a couple of questions. So uh, with our new marketing contract, we'll have things only on the bottom in those uh, blue and teal stripe. For the advertising? Yeah. So the advertising contract that we have now, we decided to not go with a fully wrapped vehicle. Right. So no one advertiser can fully wrap an entire vehicle covering it, all right. of it. We still will have side wraps and back uh, side advertisements and back advertisements as well as smaller ones. So we're trying to encourage the, the, them to go more towards the smaller advertisements. But any new vehicles that come in, we have put in um, a procedure that no advertisements will go on them for the first three years as to, to keep the um, new look of the branded look intact. So we don't want to get those brand new buses in and have them look beautiful with the new brand refresh and then immediately cover them with an advertisement. So we're trying to get all the older diesel vehicles that maybe aren't in the best shape, put advertisements on those vehicles till we get the newer ones. All right. So Great. we won't be uh, repainting anything. We'll just be replacing. Right. So the plan is with Henry's plan of purchasing new vehicles over the next five years, that any of those new vehicles that come in would be in the new branded look. And then we are looking at possibly using some funds to repaint some of our newer vehicles that we currently have now, but we're still working on that. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Shulman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Whitney. I think it's a great presentation. Um, and I, I mentioned this in the, at the planning committee meeting, um, but from a brand standpoint, so we've covered our buses, we've covered some of our collateral materials like envelopes and, and email and whatnot. Um, I know personally I'd like to see what we're doing to PSTA access, right? So are we adding those color pinstripes on, on our PSTA access? Um, the bus stop signage, the shelters, um, you know, really, you know, if we're, if we're refreshing our brand, we can't have part of our brand stuck somewhere else. Right. Um, and I realize there's a cost associated with that, but from a, from a marketing plan standpoint, it'd be nice to see that that's in the works. And Absolutely. so that we have mock-ups for those, those items. Um, I also want to say I appreciate the fact that the, the new brand is coordinated with the Sunrunner. Mm -hmm. So even though the Sunrunner is different, it is similar enough so that people have a feel that that matches. Um, what I wasn't sure of is what we're doing with the Central Avenue trolley mm -hmm. um, as far as the brand or the, or the beach trolleys um, to, to match the, the new brand. Right, okay, so let me touch on everything that you just mentioned. So <laughs> the, uh, I completely agree with you, and I apologize I didn't mention that. Um, we are kind of doing the brand refresh in a phased approach, so this is kind of our phase one, and we're hoping to hopefully be able to bring to you new design ideas for the bus stops and all of those other elements that you mentioned. There's so much that our brand touches, so we're gonna have a phased approach in how we're gonna roll those out, but hopefully we'll have those designs sooner than later. Um, and then for the, sun, yes, the Sunrunner is going to be able to work um, and integrate very cleanly with the new brand design. Um, the Central Avenue trolleys 
All of our trolleys that we used to have in our fleet were a few different designs as well, but now all of our trolleys will look the same and will have that red and yellow look to it. So it's kind of that um, everybody loves kind of the jolly trolley look and we wanted to make sure that there wasn't any confusion of what trolley is, is which. So we wanted to make sure that we had a consistent look throughout the trolley fleet as well. So that will be the new trolleys that will roll out also. We're, of course, also going to be taking a look in our brand refresh of all the different programs we have, such as, you know, TD Late Shift and Healthy Hop, and how are those in interacting with our brand as well, and how can we make sure any new services that we do going forward are going to interact with the brand in a more cohesive way. So the, the Central Avenue trolley and the, and the Beach trolleys are going to still be somewhat, you know, a separate brand. Right. Uh, of their own. They will. The, the one thing that we are doing is if you notice some of our old Central Avenue trolleys, like the PSTA brand logo is, gonna, is slightly different than what the new trolleys will have because it had, and then we're getting into the details, but the left swoosh would be like an outline and it would almost look like the red of the trolley was part of the PSTA logo. And we've created a new logo that's just solid white that would sit on the, the trolley itself. So hopefully creating some brand consistency there as far as you know not the yellow and red is specifically for the trolley but not necessarily a PSTA brand if that makes sense it, it does and, and I appreciate that um, you know when, when when embarking on a sort of brand refresh or any sort of marketing scheme we want to make sure that our customers know who we are and what we do and so I want to make sure that um, even those other services like the Central Avenue trolley that, that someone who just get drops in from from out of nowhere knows okay that's part of the same system Right. And, and they can interact with that in the same way, using the same tools, and, and gain a, a comfort level with, uh, with the different services that we offer. So No, absolutely. Thank you. No more questions. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Um, okay. Finally, uh, BJ Gavin from PSTA's Project Management Office will give us an update on changing to solar re renewable energy for our growing electric bus fleet. BJ? Good morning, Madam Chair, and PSTA Board. Every two minutes, the energy reaching the Earth from the sun is equivalent to the whole annual usage of humanity. All the energy, all the cars, everything moving, the lighting, the air conditioning in one year is equivalent to two minutes of sun. Does that change how you think about energy? Maybe you don't think about energy. But I bet you think about money. And once a month, when your power bill arrives, that's where the two meet. The same thing happens here at PSTA, except we have people that think about energy a lot. We've got a planning department, project management office, operations and maintenance, and of course, the executive office. I'm going to share with you how PSTA is going to stop paying for power. <laughs> and while doing so, reduce carbon emissions, boost PSTA's resiliency, and bolster infrastructure serving the people of Pinellas County. And together, with the board leading the way, can embark on a future of sustainable energy. Back in January of this year, PSTA board adopted the Sustainable Strategic Plan. And in that plan, we laid out the secret of our strategy. Slide. Photovoltaic solar panels. Slide. What we didn't lay out was our goal of 100% renewable energy. Slide. Reduce carbon emissions, reduce energy costs, increase resiliency. Capturing solar energy allows us to reduce our energy costs. By using solar to power our buildings, we can reduce our energy bill down to zero. Now there's another piece here that I haven't mentioned yet. What about the buses? What about the energy to power the buses? Now this presentation is not about buses, but of course everything we do comes back to serving the people of Pinellas County, and we do that primarily through our bus service. Currently we have six e-buses, we have two on order. These e-buses run on batteries, which get plugged in here at our campus. With solar here at PSTA, we could generate 100% of the renewable energy to charge those buses. 
We are working closely with operations and maintenance to plan a solar PV array to match energy forecasts as we increase our electric fleet. So as our e-bus fleet increases, we believe in having so a solar array that can supply the energy needed for those buses. Buses are the biggest part of reducing these carbon emissions for PSTA. A solar array can supply the energy needed for PSTA campus as well as power these buses. Increased resiliency is the third benefit of solar. During normal operations, our plan would to be to have PSTA be self-sustaining. However, in the event of a natural disaster, a fully implemented solar PV array would allow us to island our facility as its own microgrid serving all of our power needs. How do we get there? This all starts with capturing the energy, storing the energy, and using the energy. And who knows more about that than Duke Energy? So past partnerships with Duke and PSTA include the depot chargers, which power our current e-buses out in the transit yard. We've got DC fast chargers in the employee and guest parking lot for e-vehicles of employees or guests. And we have wireless induction chargers that we partnered with them as well for on-route charging. PSTA is currently uh, exploring a continued partnership as the agency looks to this 100% renewable energy future. We would cement this with a master service agreement between Duke and PSTA. So what will this look like? Slide. Here you'll recognize our 36 acre campus, but what this graphic also includes are the solar panels in blue. We're focusing on three key areas. Slide. Here we have area A, which is our administrations and operations building. We're looking at a roof installation here of the solar panels. Slide. Here we've got area B, this is our transit yard. This would be an elevated solar array above the buses, uh, targeting minimal to zero functional change in our transit yard. Slide. And here we have area C. This is our employee and guest parking lot. Again, elevated above vehicles, lower than the buses, but um, this would also have zero to minimal functional change in the parking lot. Slide. We had a very exciting visit Go ahead and advance the slide. Thank you. We had a very exciting visit with Duke Energy the week before last where we shared this vision of PSTA. Slide. 100% renewable energy future. Duke is assembling a proposal on how they can partner with us to achieve our goal. Meanwhile, we are looking into additional grant opportunities for project funding. So this is an information item only in your agenda. However, December, maybe January, we'll be back before you with an update. Any questions? I have a question about Hit your mic. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Thank yes, you for that presentation. This is one of my biggest passions. And my question is, when you say we're working on 100% renewable, by when? We don't have a target date yet. So uh, as we work with Duke, we, uh, we have a meeting, I think even this afternoon, uh, where they're going to lay out what it would take to get here. So we're still in the understanding process. Uh, as I said, we had them on campus. We had their electrical engineers and their solar engineers here to take a tour and, and understand the facility. So we'll have a, we'll have a better idea of that. Um, the, uh, and, and then hopefully in, in December or January, we'll be able to speak to that better. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank exciting. You. Uh, sorry, Commissioner Shulman. Thank you. Um, just one Don't quick question. Away. Don't go away. I'll chase <laughs> you down. Um, it occurred to me you were talking about the uh, the Duke Energy Chargers that exist here on campus. Um, is there any plan to add those to the park and ride locations? That that right now is not part of the conversation. Um, but uh, but I can I can take down that note, and I mean we can we can ask. It's, it's a little bit different um, when, when we control the energy here on campus and, and where it comes into. So uh, it's, it's certainly something that we can raise. The, the park and ride is, um, I, I, if there is energy going in there, I mean, certainly, certainly it, it's, you know, it's worth exploring that conversation. So. Yeah, because I just checked their, um, their, their map system and there isn't anything really around that area. Um, but it may also help our customers. Um, 
make that yeah, switch I, as well. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if at our park and ride we have any energy being used right now. Our, our, um, our 8 by 10 or 8 by 12 shelters that we typically have at those locations are already solar. They're just independent unto themselves. Um, so, uh, but we can certainly look into it. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Hit your microphone. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think this is great. It's wonderful. But I've got some questions about batteries because we never talk about batteries. Uh, so I have several questions. How long do the batteries last in the bus? That would be more a bus question for Henry. So okay, I don't have so an answer. So then the next that. question I have is um, how do we safely, what is the plan to safely dispose of those batteries when they're done? And, and nobody's really ever talking about, we all talk about solar and how great it is, but we never talk about the batteries and then how we safely dispose of them. And I just want to know what the plan is for the PSTA on disposal of those batteries when the time comes. Commissioner Peters, uh, the expected lifespans of the batteries vary between 12 to 26 years, depending upon the particular chemistry. Now. Batteries are actually one of the most recyclable commodities right now. They're in high demand. Uh, currently, the batteries that we have on our hybrid electric buses, we do recycle. In fact, there's a very vast aftermarket potential there. Uh, I can tell you that most batteries, once they are decommissioned out of transit buses, go on to live a second life as a wayside energy storage means for solar panel storage. But for those that don't, yes, all of the bus manufacturers subscribe to um, recycling programs in compliance with the EPA. To, to, the, to the user, no. Thank you, Henry. Okay. If there are no further questions, we'll move on to reports and correspondence and future meeting topics. Brad, do you have any comments on all that? Uh, I just have a comment that um, Commissioner Peters' question was a good one, though. A number of people have asked about that question about the batteries and what happens to them. But I think we have a good plan for that. Um, First off, I would like to just make a, a great comment that about there are some questions about the benefits of PSTA leading on the um, ele uh, electric bus contracts. Um, one, as uh, Al and Henry both mentioned, we just came back from the Florida Public Transit Association Conference in Daytona, and there's an enormous benefit of just walking around a conference and just having every single person pat you on the back and say, what a great job your staff has done. Your staff is so awesome. And it just kind of makes you feel good. That's a good, and then second, it was a good strategy yesterday when the trade show was happening and every single bus company kept, as they always do, as, oh, you're gonna come by our booth and check out our bus? I was like, no, I gotta go home to PSDA to get you your contract. And they're like, okay, go. We don't want to talk to you. So that was a good strategy, too. Um, at your places are a couple of upcoming events uh, that if you're in St. Petersburg on Halloween next week, next weekend, um, Central Avenue is going to be closed down. And there's lots of activities um, that the businesses along there are, are going to be out on the street and promoting. And, I, and we're going to have um, what the, new, the new trolleys. Uh, so, uh, there to show them off, and I think Commissioner Driscoll is going to be making some comments at that on Halloween. Um, and you can wear a costume too. I heard. Um, Maybe. <laughs> oh, are you going to wear a costume? Fully committed to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> save the date on December third. We'll send out a an Outlook thing on this too. Um, the on December third. Um, right by City Hall there at that station, we'll, we will get a um, get the um, the vertical elements of the station delivered from Orlando, and sort of highlight a completed station for the Sunrunner. All of them are being completed along the lines now, but this one will 
also highlight the public art, the beautiful public art, which is this, these glass images, um, will be there on December 3rd. So plan for that. I think, um, thank you very much. Most of you, I think, have completed an email survey from Rachel about your interest in serving on committees. The nominating committee is scheduled now for November 15th, and so if you, ha if you have any other thoughts on committees you'd like to be on or not like to be on or whatever, um, send them in by then, and then the nominating committee will meet and assign people based on those surveys, and then that'll come to your, your next board meeting. So and if you, you don't sign up for anything, we will randomly assign you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Something that's you right. don't want, so. That's right. <laughs> okay, anything else, Brad? That's it. Okay, we, any comments from board members? Okay. We are adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, we are not adjourned. Quick reminder, um, on the 28th, which is tomorrow, I'm hosting a um, community conversation regarding the Tampa Innovation Center that's coming. Um, that's some of right. you have already heard about it, but uh, we have a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we've partnered with Kathy Wood, who is well known on the um, industry market side of things, um, especially Wall Street. But this is a hub that will be located um, off of 6th Street in St. Petersburg, and it's geared towards um, small minority and women-owned businesses being able to partner and, um, with a mentor from a corporation or an industry that um, has uh, either high-tech um, uh, employment possibilities or to uh, just receive some additional education in certain areas. So that is tomorrow evening at the Enoch Davis Center in St. Petersburg, Florida at 6 o'clock. It's only going to last an hour and a half. That's the presentation question and answer. So if you... Um, aren't doing anything, please, you know, stop by. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Uh, we've raised $15.78 million um, for the project, and there's $1.5 million outstanding, which is only for the furnishing. So um, this has been a project that was in the making before I uh, became a county commissioner, but it's my understanding that a lot of people are glad it is crossing the finish line. So um, hope to see you there just to hear more about what's going on and what we're trying to do with high-tech high -tech jobs in our county. Great. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? I think Commissioner. Sorry. Announcement that I hope if you all are available next Monday between 3 and 7, we are welcoming Irvin Magic Johnson to the Ooh. city of St. Petersburg for all of you NBA fans. Um, and he's coming to speak on health and pass out turkeys. So we'll be at the <laughs> TROP. He will be present from 4 to 6. Um, if you aren't doing anything, please come by and just welcome him to the city, um, as well as we try to share the, the importance of uh, a healthy living. So again, that's this Monday, November 1st, from 3 to 7. He will be present from 4 to 6. That's cool. Thank you. Anything else? We are adjourned. Great. Okay. November first, you can get your vaccine, and then you can go see Magic Johnson. Uh, I think my daughter is going. She's going to be dressing up with her friends, but uh, I'm going to try to go. Just a little bit. You could, yeah, from where you are. Yes, you could take the. You could take the That's why I wore a long sleeve. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.